Thank you for joining me again today. You know, I'm really encouraged by the fact that some people are watching these videos. I've, I've never set out to do this to have a big audience or, or think that the, the teaching that we're doing here is, is some super exceptional teaching beyond what's being offered other places. But still, I'm glad to be able to record these messages. I'm so thankful for the opportunity God's provided for me to share these with our youth group. And I hope that some of you are, are learning from these and gaining something and growing closer to the Lord as well. So please open your Bibles to Mark 7, starting with verse 31. Uh, today we're going to look at two narratives within Mark's gospel and end with Mark 8, 9. I'll, I'll also put these passages on the screen. Last week we looked at Mark 7 and I shared a message about the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, her encounter with Jesus took place in Tyre and then Jesus traveled through Sidon, into the Sea of Galilee to a Gentile region called the Decapolis. As I mentioned last week, the, the regions of Tyre and Sidon were notorious enemies of Israel. This region is modern-day Lebanon, and, and sadly, this week, Israel was attacked by missiles from Hezbollah operating out of Lebanon. And, Lebanon, and I, I'm not trying to, I don't fully understand the complexity to the situation in the Middle East, but regardless, tension just continues between the people of Israel and the people of this region, even as we speak 2,000 years later, and, and we should be praying for them, for all of them. This week, however, Jesus moves back towards Israel in the Sea of Galilee, but he's still in a Gentile region. Besides, for Jesus and the disciples, the remaining subjects in these narratives are Gentiles. So we'll cover two short narratives today, and I'll, I'll tackle them one at a time. Let me open us first in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and for all the students at Grounded who will be hearing this message tomorrow uh, and, and for people who might be uh, checking this out online. Please help us to make uh, today a great experience. Help us to honor you, to put you first in our lives. Today we're looking at your witness to the Gentiles. Thanks for your grace and extending your kingdom to all people, every tribe, race, gender, people from every background. If you hadn't done so, we'd all be without hope. Help us as we open up your word. Help us to present it accurately and clearly. And please be with us and show us what you want us to hear and how you want it to apply to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So now we'll look at, at the passage, uh, Mark 7, starting with verse 31. Then he, Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphta, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened. His tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So from this story, we can see that Jesus is continuing his inclusion to the Gentiles in his mission of ushering in the kingdom of God. The story also demonstrates Jesus' compassion. And again, Mark clearly shows that Jesus' compassion extends to both Jews and Gentiles. I think one of the most important purposes for Mark's inclusion of this episode within the gospel is the fact that it, it provides us further evidence that Jesus is the Messiah and God. When he concludes the passage and says, they were astonished beyond measure saying he has done all things well, it reminds us of creation where God created on, on each day and at the end of the day he said it was good. And when he was completed with all of his creation, he said it is good. Here we're seeing this, this kind of language being used that says that everything Jesus did, the crowd recognized, was done well. And I think furthermore, there, there's some more connection to the Old Testament that'll help us even more in terms of, of seeing what this is. The story, you know, it's one of the most important purposes of Mark's inclusion of this episode is, is the fact that it provides us evidence that Jesus is the Messiah and that Jesus is in fact God. Mark's gospel is a, a fast-paced, a hard-hitting gospel. He doesn't include nearly as much material as the other gospels. And it's also written to a primarily Gentile audience. He, he doesn't rely on Old Testament scripture as much as, as is done in the other gospels. But when he does 
cite or allude to Old Testament scripture, you can be sure it's significant, it's foundational, it's important. And in this passage, Mark uses a Greek word, magalalos, which is used only one other place in the Bible, and that's in Isaiah 35. The word means to have a serious speech impediment. Remember, Mark was almost certainly working from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And in the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation, the word magalalos is only used in Isaiah 35 and nowhere else. And so I think it would help us if you'd want to, to turn your, your Bible with me to Isaiah 35 and, and look at verses 1 through 6. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They see, they shall see the glory of the Lord. The majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame man leaped like a deer and the tongue of the mute, or here in the Septuagint, the word is magalalos, the same word that Mark's using, shall sing for joy. Isaiah 35 is a description of the revelation of the glory of God, the glory of the Lord. The first 34 chapters of Isaiah deals specifically with God's judgment of Edom and Egypt, Tyre, Israel, and specifically Jerusalem. But the allusion here is to Isaiah 35, and this is important because in chapter 35, the, the theme of Isaiah's prophecy changes from judgment to restoration and redemption. Isaiah prophesies about the coming day of the Lord, where the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The deaf will receive their hearing, and the mute will receive their speech. And also in the day of the Lord, the desert wastelands of Lebanon, the very region Jesus has just been traveling through, will receive the joy of God. This can't be overstated. Jesus in his ministry just traveled through Lebanon, and he's healing this deaf person, this mute person. And it says in this passage in Isaiah 35, written hundreds of years before, that the, the region of Lebanon is going to receive redemption and restoration and joy and that they're going to see the glory of God. And the glory of God is going to be seen by the deaf hearing and the mute speaking. And the very word that's used there is only used one other place in the Bible, Isaiah 35, and then also in this passage in Mark. Mark's connecting Jesus with the future day of the Lord, Isaiah prophesied about. Jesus is here. He's ushering in the kingdom of God. And he's providing the first fruits, the first taste of the way for that future restoration of all things. Mark connects Jesus here with the Old Testament promises in the way that, that unmistakably not only release, reveals Jesus' Messiahship, the fact that he's the Messiah, but also the fact that Jesus is God. This fits really nicely within Mark's gospel outline. It connects the previous passage where Jesus is continuing to extend God's promises and inclusion within the kingdom of God to the Gentiles. That's happening again here. And the first seven chapters of, of Mark's gospel reach their pinnacle in, in the next chapter, in chapter 8, with Peter's Caesarea Philippi confession. And where he, Jesus asks them, who, who do you say that I am? And he says that you are the Christ. Mark's making one of the strongest revelations of Jesus' deity, of his being God. And undoubtedly, Peter realized that only God will bring the joy to the desert of the wasteland, Lebanon, and give the blind their sight and the deaf their hearing. Peter's witnessing this, and, and we're going to see shortly that Peter responds to who Jesus asks him, who he thinks he is, and he says, you're the Christ. And we'll get to that um, soon, probably next week. But I want to then look at the next passage. And that's Jesus' feeding of the 4,000. You can find that in Mark 8. And I'm going to go ahead and put that up on the screen for you as well. But let me read it for you. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called upon his disciples to him and he said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them 
come from afar, from far away? And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven, and he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples and set them before the people, and he set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Mark's account of this feeding of the 4,000 is very similar to the account we just looked at not long ago with the feeding of the 5,000. It's similar, and so similar, that some have questioned whether it's a doublet or a repeat of the same event. And there's some comparisons between the two that are worth noticing the similarities and the differences. Some of the similarities would be the the repeat of Jesus' question, how many loaves do you have? And I'm taking some of this from the New Pillar Commentary. In fact, I'm I'm taking this chart, I've, I've devised this chart from some of the text in there. But there's also a command for everybody to sit down and recline. What's emphasized by Mark's Gospel is Jesus' compassion on the crowds. The leftovers are collected after the feeding. So I could see why some would would think that it's a doublet, especially with the, the peculiar question of the disciples, which we'll get to in a minute. But there's also a lot of differences. In fact, the differences are pretty substantial. In the first feeding, there's five loaves and two fish, where in the second feeding, there's seven loaves and a few fish. There's a different word for fish. In the first reading, the, the word that's used is a reference to a small fish, probably like a sardine. Whereas in the second reading there's or the second story there the word that's used is just a a more general word for fish in the first feeding there was five thousand men plus women and children so there could have been eight thousand ten thousand twelve thousand people there whereas in the second feeding there's a a smaller crowd there's four thousand people which might sound like 20 percent less but that was encompassing of men women and children so it's probably like half as many or, or or even less than half as many still a very large crowd the the first crowd was with Jesus one day, the second crowd three days. The first one was springtime, the second there was no mention of seasons. And in the first he broke the, the people into groups, and in the second he didn't break them into groups. But remember, as we looked at that previous message, the breaking of the people into the groups had some symbolic significance. It, it was an allusion to Old Testament um, references. And, and so it wouldn't have made sense for him to make that same allusion in this almost exclusively Gentile audience. In the first story, there was 12 baskets left over, and in the second, there was seven. A lot of people make a lot of the seven baskets left over, and, and it could certainly mean something like a perfect number or infinite, but but we really can't read too strongly into that. Mark isn't as symbolic of, a, of an author as some of the other gospel writers, so the question of whether the seven baskets and, and how that works is 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 un, undetermined. It's undeterminable. It might be, in fact, that it does represent a, a perfect or a infinite number. But the, the strongest argument for the theory that it's a doublet, that it's a repeat of the story, is that his disciples answered him and said, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And that's a confusing question because they had seen the 5,000 feeding, the feeding of the 5,000. So I think that there is a strong argument in that respect, but I think there's a much, much stronger argument that it's a, a separate occurrence. Because the more we evaluate the evidence the more convincing it is that they're two distinct occurrences. The disciples didn't expect Jesus to be some kind of a genie in a bottle. He wouldn't provide signs and miracles to solve every single problem. So the idea that he would just repeat that miracle uh, for the for the disciples not to assume that would, would be understandable. Seeking signs is, is characteristic of Jesus' opponents. The, the Pharisees wanted a sign. The religious leaders wanted a sign. The unbelievers wanted a sign. But his followers weren't seeking signs. It doesn't make sense that his disciples would have demanded a sign from Jesus or just assumed that he would have done a miracle or repeated that magnificent uh, previous miracle. The differences are significant. The the flow of Mark's gospel also is my strongest conviction or my my reason that I most believe that, that it's a separate event. It makes sense to include the story here only if it's a separate event and not as a doublet. Jesus first fed the Jews and then the Gentiles. His ministry is first to the Jews, 
And in, in this first part of Mark's gospel, we're beginning to see how it overflows and extends to the Gentiles. There, there's just no doubt in my mind that this is a separate event. But let's just take a, a step back now and, and see how these events fit in together in the light of the rest of Mark's gospel. Mark's gospel began with John the Baptist arrival on the scene, and we learned that he came in the spirit in the prophet of Eli- in the spirit of the prophet Elijah, the prophet who was to usher in the Messiah. John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River, and God provided a miraculous response to his bapti- baptism, identifying Jesus as the Son with whom God is well pleased. Then Jesus resisted Satan's temptations after his fasting in the wilderness. And then Jesus went throughout Israel teaching with an authority that was beyond even anything that they've ever seen, beyond what they've read from the prophets or seen from their modern scribes. Jesus showed compassion to hundreds, probably thousands of people, healing them and exercising demons. Certainly when you look at the feeding of the five and four thousand, we're already in the thousands just there. Jesus walked on water. Jesus fed the crowds. Even though Mark's writing to a primarily Gentile audience in Rome, it's just unmistakable that Mark's connecting Jesus' ministry to Old Testament passages and prophecies and the miracles of Jesus themselves that he performs are unmistakably the miracles that the Old Testament prophesied would be done by the Messiah. But we're also seeing that Jesus is doing things like walking on water, and the Old Testament says that can only be done by God. The religious leaders were becoming more and more hostile toward Jesus' ministry. In fact, even the neighbors that Jesus grew up with tried to kill him. In today's story, we see Jesus continue to have compassion on the Gentiles, describing that the kingdom of God is both for Jews and Gentiles as God always intended. We're seeing Jesus extend the feeding of the the 5,000 now to doing it for the Gentiles with 4,000. But remember, the the feeding includes both the feeding of the loaves, but also the teaching of Jesus. Man isn't to live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we see that Jesus is God, and we see that God now is speaking both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Jesus heals the deaf and mute man, and Mark connects that miracle to Isaiah 35, which refers to the God's promise of bringing restoration and redemption, especially to the Gentile territories, specifically to Lebanon where he is. In the next chapter, Jesus asked Peter, who do the people say that I am? And the last seven chapters up to this point have begged an all-important question. It's the most important question any of us will ever be asked. And in that chapter, Jesus asked the question of Peter, and today I'm asking it of you. Audience, who do you say that I am, being Jesus? Who do you say that Jesus is? Normally, I try to provide some kind of an application, but today I just want to challenge you to even spend five or ten minutes in individual prayer. Maybe take ten minutes to pray considering the prompt, you know, Brad, who do you say that I am? Insert your name. Who do you say that I am? If you're not 100% sure that you're a Christian, that you're a follower of God, that you understand what it means to, to be a believer, that you're not sure if the Holy Spirit has changed your heart and, and given you a new heart, then I, I pray that you would. Reach out to God and and ask him to show you, to clearly articulate who he is and where you stand in relation to him. And if you are a Christian, I, I implore you to just seek God and say, who are you, God? How do I need to know you better? What do you want to reveal about yourself to me? What have you revealed to me that I've ignored? And so today, I just, I don't want to leave you with a great application, but maybe just an encouragement to pray, to think about this passage and to go to the Lord and ask him, who, do you, who are you, Lord? What do I need to better understand about who you are today? Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I wish all you guys the best. God bless.